Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, I think now sixth uh, iteration of the Vimo seminar. Um, yeah, it's my great pleasure to to have uh, Ming Wang today um, giving the seminar. So I assume most of you probably know Ming as uh, yeah like the brain behind uh, GMPS. But uh, in case you do not know him, then let me give you a, a very brief introduction. So uh, Ming studied computer science at uh, in uh, uh, Missouri before he then moved uh, for his PhD to the University of California in, in San Diego, uh, where I was fortunate to to meet him back, back as a grad student back then. But then, uh, uh, yeah, like we continued a little bit together, Ming and myself as, as postdoctoral researchers. Before then, uh, yeah, very recently last year, Ming got a position as a, a assistant professor at the University of California, Riverside down the road. And yeah, I think he made some uh, monumental contributions in the development of computational mass spectrometry tools that I guess uh, many of you are using. And yeah, it's my my great pleasure to have him today here to tell us a little bit more about uh, mass QL and uh, perhaps some uh, yeah like repository scale uh, mass spec searches. So yeah, Ming, the floor is yours. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me. And great to see everybody, um, at least virtually. One of these days, you guys got to come to ASMS. Just I'm jazzing it up right now just to put it in your mind. ASMS this year in 2024 is in Anaheim. Think about it. Uh, and in two years, it's in San Diego proper. So if you at least come to the San Diego one, we will have a barbecue at either Peter's house or my house. Uh, so I'm just you know, getting that out there. Um, and it'll, it'll be, it'll be a great time. Anyway, um, it's a pleasure to talk to you about some of the new tools we've been working on in, in my lab at UC Riverside. Uh, as Danny said, you know, a lot of these tools, uh, they come because of collaborations, right? So chatting with scientists actually trying to do real things as, you know, as computer scientists, we're, we're just kind of glorified applied mathematicians, right? So we don't really actually know anything about the real world. And so, working with everybody, these these ideas and thinking about the right tool for the right job really is distilled due to the needs and kind of the creativity also um, of the collaborators that I have. So I've been very fortunate in that. So there's a big shout out to, to those people. Um, and so a lot of the our focus in our lab, um, MassQL here, we're going to talk about one of them, is we want to make you know new computational concepts because we are in a computer science department, but at the same time we want to marry that with things that are actually useful, right? So uh, it's kind of a difficult balance to strike, but when you do it, you know we don't hit it all the time, but it's it's kind of it's kind of fun. So one thing I want to start with MassQL as a as a as an idea and as a project, uh, we started. Oh, here's first of all, here are my disclosures. Um, and so this started, you know, this idea started a few years ago, just kind of everything starts as a small kernel, right? And so one of the, the things is, um, you know, I was working with Peter and we're, we're great collaborators and he's, he's a chemist and he's, you know, a, a forever curious guy. And so we, we did a lot of work in the last 10 years of making uh, data public uh, from the community, making that available, making that searchable and things like that. Um, and and be able to reanalyze it. So that you know, we thought we we were we you know move the needle in that in that aspect. And so one of the things that Peter kind of was curious about is okay, well we have all this data. Could we go in and search for for example all carnitine molecules in that data? Right. So you know, kind of a you know, off the cuff kind of question. And so you know, I'm I'm a computer scientist, but I know a little bit about chemistry. And so what I know is, you know, certain kinds of structural features of molecules, whether it's the composition, specific element, uh, whether there's some sort of structural moiety uh, that imprints some sort of signature that is reproducible uh, to an extent in the mass spectrometry data, whether it's isotopic in the MS1, whether it's uh, fragmentation based in the MS2 um, or MSN for that matter. And so I happen to know that this, this happens, right? And so for carnity specifically, I know a little bit, maybe a little bit more. I know that they fragment in a certain way. There's like this nitrogen with a little charge on it and things like that. Um, but more, more importantly, I know something about characteristic fragmentation of carnity molecules. There's like neutral losses of 
it's something like 59 and uh, an 85 uh, MS2 peak that's always there. So what I could do is I take this knowledge. I know how to build these systems. I know how to build software. And we could say, okay, one off, we can build a you know, a piece of software that searches only for carnitines. Um, and we can build this infrastructure to, you know, search for it once and shepherding all the, the, the cluster tools and the data so that we can find all putative carnitine molecules across all public data once, right? That's cool. We can make a data product. You probably write a paper about it. Um, but, you know, this all came from kind of a, a flip comment from Peter. Not that he wasn't serious, but it's, you know, it, it's just kind of a fun conversation. But then the moment you do that, Peter will want to do everything else. Or chemists, they have, you know, you have a lot of imagination and the kind of compounds that you are interested in. You want to do that for everything else, right? So instead of just carnitine, it's brominate compounds, siderophore, saccharides, whether it's uh, activity, uh, composition, or substructure kind of question. You want to be able to do this across everything. Um, and so as a computer scientist, we're, we're, we're pretty lazy. You know? I'm not in the business of uh, writing, you know, one-off software for one particular application, uh, that's no fun, that's no fun. Um, rather, what we wanna think about is now that you have a taste for what you can do, you wanna be able to do this, right? And how can we, can we build some sort of computational system that enables chemists to do this? So me as a computer scientist, I don't have to do anything. I just wanna sit back, let the computer hum and chemists can do all the work. So. Uh, we hope the answer is yes. So that empowers the the community, especially those are that are significantly less, you know, computationally savvy. Even though the world is getting to a place where you know more and more people use compute, there are certain kinds of expertises that you, you just haven't developed, right? Especially large scale data mining and shepherding data, especially when we're talking about you know 50, 100 terabytes of data on a computational cluster and making sure that everything works and you can actually visualize them. So that's a skill set that a lot of chemists probably lack. Um, and so one of the things that we created is called MassQLs, or short for the mass spec query language. Um, and the, the pillars, that, the design principles behind this is that it needs to be understandable. So you as a chemist, you need to be able to read and write this very naturally. Because you could you know, write Python. That's not, it's pretty verbose, depending on what you want. And it's not particularly natural um, in, in how you think. And so that provides, that's a, you know, other languages are a significant barrier to entry. Uh, number two, it needs to be flexible, right? So you need to be able to define some sort of complex mass spectrometry pattern, or at least complex enough to solve what you want to find um, and have these, you know, mass spec adjacent properties. Uh, it needs to be scalable. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense that if you can just do, you know, one data file, you probably can handle one data file just fine. But if it can't handle hundreds of thousands to, you know, potentially millions in the future, then you know, you're not really taking advantage of the computational aspect here um, in, in spaces that you absolutely cannot mine manually. Um, and finally, it has to be reusable. If you're taking all this time to construct some sort of patterns, which is honestly a distillation of a lot of chemical knowledge into a succinct pattern, this should be reusable by the community. And so um, in the most selfish way, the most reusable, the, the, the most practical reusability element is not somebody else. It's actually you in six months, because let's be honest, we forget a lot of things. But more practically for a lot of PIs is training new staff and uh, students. Um, so this is one way that you can pass down knowledge in a codified way that's, you know what it means, um, and then you can get up and running productively um, without, you know, I think all of us have done this you point to um, a computer screen and maybe a chromatogram or an MS2 and you say, hey, think about this peak. This is, this is interesting. Well, that's, that's good for education to some extent, but it's not particularly reproducible. Um, so we want this, this resource to be usable. So just kind of going through these elements and how we achieve these goals. First of all, we want this to be easy to read and write. So just as an example, walking through it, if you all have not seen MassQL, so at the top is MassQL, we have uh, some automated translations to uh, several different languages. And so here we're saying, we wanna find MS2 spectra and we start putting some conditions around it. So we want an MS2 spectra where there's an MS2 peak of 468 with a particular tolerance. And you can kind of see, we can add multiple conditions, start layering these things on um, with a amount of specificity that you 
um, probably need um, to find exactly what you want in your data. And so we're able to go to explain to yourself, if you see a query, we can explain this to you. Um, and that's great. I think that, that helps um, lower some barriers to entry. But uh, again, I think me as a scientist, sometimes I'm pretty lazy too. Um, and I think all of us want to be a little lazy. But if we want to trans translate in the other direction, going from some natural language back to MassQL without you even having to learn MassQL, or maybe it's your first time, you don't know how to write MassQL. Maybe let, let's let you see some examples. Um, we've been, we have a few models out now, and you can actually use them on um, ChatGPT uh, that does a very good job. Um, we'll, we'll demo some, it's like scarily impressive um, how, it, how it does this. So um, we'll, 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 we'll play around with some of these things, but if you wanna get started, that's a good place to get started with MassQL. Um, number two, uh, it needs to be flexible. So just to give you a, a, a brief taste of a subset of the, some of the things you can describe. Again, it's not particularly the fanciest thing in the world, um, but you can start building these up into more complex uh, constraints. And so number one on the top left, if there's a particular peak mass, you can find it. Very straightforward. You can also think about tolerances, minimum intensities, and things like that. Additionally, you can have peak losses from precursor. So you can see on the top right-hand side. Uh, third in the bottom left, you can look at uh, gaps between two different peaks in a spectrum. Any two peaks, maybe they, they want to differ in this particular case by 217. You can, regardless of where that peak sits. And another thing you can talk about is relative peak intensities between uh, different peaks of different masses in a spectrum. So this is a little bit more useful if you're talking about isotopes, or especially if you know the acquisition settings for, for MS2 intensities as well. But the bottom line is you can mix and match all of these primitives into something that's more complex. So you just put qualifiers around them. But there's, there's other fancy things that you can do uh, like or statements and requiring three out of four peaks appearing in a spectrum that you define. But we that's, that's that's something we can talk about kind of offline. But this is just a preview of some of the things that you can do from a pure mass spec standpoint, but you can also start Label, uh, layering on retention time, IO mobility, and things like that. So just one example that actually Daniel and I kind of wor workshopped and one of the very early examples of everything working is he was interested in, from his PhD work, I think it's your PhD work, um, on looking at albicidin, which is a natural product um, that he was interested in. And so he knew, because he understands the chemistry of, of all this, that a family of albicidins had a fragment of 468 and 660. So that's kind of a something that's reasonably conserved in this, this type of molecule. And he was able to write this particular query. Again, not the fanciest thing, but given five minutes to, for him to learn the language, I think it's not a particularly bad result. So once you write it, that's really quick. What we were able to do is take his data that he published on in 2017 and search again for all of the albicidin molecules in this untargeted metabolomics data set. And so what we were able to do very quickly was refine all of the mass spec MS2 spectra with MassQL that he had published on. Now, MassQL is not gonna solve the structure for you, but it is a prioritization tool for you to think about where to focus your effort. And those MS2 came up, these are the structures that he identified in that publication. So that's great, we can recreate what he did in terms of reprioritizing these albicidin molecules. Now, what was more interesting for me is even though Danny had manually analyzed this data back in 2017, there were a lot more molecules that were albicidin-like that he didn't publish on. That MassQL, because it's exhaustive, was able to prioritize those for, you know, for analysis. Not that we really did follow up and did NMR and all that stuff, but this kind of illustrates the purpose that you can be comprehensive in your analysis of your data and more comprehensive than you could have done manually. And so here is a molecular network where each circle represents a unique molecule. And in blue are the ones that Danny identified in his original paper. And in gray are the putative analogs that uh, MassQL pulled out. So it essentially doubles the number of albicidin analogs that were in the data that weren't particularly called out in the publication. Um, and so you could see this reflected back on your own work. If you wanna go remine old data sets to find new analogs, perhaps that's a new paper for you all, 
Um, but just really understanding that chemical diversity and being systematic about it is, is the point that I want to illustrate here. And so number three, we want to be scalable. And so uh, we, you know, if you have within your lab, what you're, whatever you're collecting, you know, a few hundred uh, LCMS files, maybe analyzing that is not the easiest thing in the world. MassQL, it's just kind of very easy to scale to a few hundred data sets uh, or LCMS files. One of the things that we also wanted to scale to is entire repositories of all data ever being generated by the mass spec community, at least that's made public. And so we're talking about a billion tandem mass spectra on that sort of scale, a few hundred thousand LCMS runs. So not the most trivial set of data. Um, so just to show you that it does work, you can do this now at GMPS2. Um, one, one collaborator is Nina Zhao at UCSD. And so she's, ex she's interested in organophosphate esters. Just a little bit of background. Um, they're, flame, they're used in flame retardants. There's a large diversity of this particular chemical class, and it's not particularly healthy for humans, and it ends up in our waterways, right? So one of the things that Nina's interested in is what is the diversity of this family of compounds so that we actually know what, you know, what molecules are entering our waterways, so then we can think about, you know, quantifying them and really understanding the, the, the biological effect. But, but back, flipping back to a chemistry context, for Nina, she has, she's quite familiar with these molecules. And what she knew is at least the phosphate portions will produce a 98.98 MRZ. And she was able to write a particular query. She also said, well, you know, it needs to be the biggest peak in the spectrum. That's kind of how it fragments. It's like, okay, you know the chemistry, you can define the pattern. Let's kind of roll this sort of query out and really start seeing how prevalent this family of molecules is at the repository scale when we look at everybody's data. And so what we're able to do is take all the public data that we could. So this is about 1.1 billion MSMS spectra. And then if we apply that particular MassQL query, we can whittle this down to about 338,000 tandem mass spectra. And just to give you an idea of how long this takes across all of this data, it's on the order of a few hours um, to, to do this particular query. So not the fastest thing in the world, and we're working on techniques to, to make this faster. Um, but in differences, you probably couldn't do this. So uh, we think that's not a particularly uh, tall hill to climb waiting a, you know, half a day to, to wait to get the results for these things. And so with 338 MSMS spectra, that's still quite a bit for people to manually go through. And so what we did was we took it through a lot of the GMPS2 uh, workflows. We clustered identical spectra to reduce redundancy and we organi organized it into families of related what we think are related uh, molecules based upon similar fragmentation. And so this reduced it from 338,000 to about 3,000 unique spectra down to about 169 families of compounds. And so just to highlight kind of some of the findings we got out of this, here is one family of organophosphate esters that out of the 169 in the analysis in pink or each oval represents a unique molecule. And in pink are the identified molecules and in blue are the molecules that weren't identified. And so they potentially are novel uh, uh, organophosphate, excuse me, esters. And so generally less than 10% of these were identified. Um, but what was unique and kind of the takeaway messages here was that Nina was able to find new organophosphate esters, number one, because some of her data she published on a few years ago ended up in this network. So she was able to even find more from this global analysis from her data. And also she was able to discover new organophosphate esters that came from public data sets. And those particular analogs were not in her data. So that was the unique value proposition of being able to scale up and capture the whole chemical diversity of this compound class um, that your own data might've missed. So that's kind of one showcase of the advantage of really scaling up. Um, and finally, this, this reusability aspect um, and sharing aspect. And so if Danny's gonna take some of this effort to apply his knowledge and his brain about this family of compounds for albicidins, we wanna save that in case somebody else, number one, wants an example of a certain type of compound, but also specifically just within labs and within communities, they wanna just wanna borrow and have codified knowledge. And so what we created is a MassQL compendium. And so what we can do here is uh, go in and uh, people can curate 
uh, MassQL query doesn't describe what it is, and you can have your name associated with it. And people can immediately select it and reuse it. Um, and so that's just a nice way to kind of collect all these things. And there's a web, you can go to the website, massql.gmps2.org. But additionally, to make this really reusable um, and really powerful as a concept, MassQL as a concept, first we created a reference Python implementation. We have a formal grammar for the language. So there's, we know what's valid and what's invalid MassQL. We also have an R implementation. If a lot of bioinformaticians um, and chemists like to use R. So if you want to use that, definitely uh, you can you can use that implementation. Um, and these are kind of free open source for everybody to use. Um, but additionally, MassQL has been starting to integrate it into a lot of open source mass spectrometry analysis tools. So obviously we have it at GMPS, you, in GMPS2, you can do it online, you can do it interactively. And we'll show a few examples of this. But another thing is it's been integrated into tools like MZMine, uh, OpenMS, MS Dial, uh, and also commercial software such as Metabloscape. So, so a lot of these are some of the most popular uh, software tools in the community for uh, metabolomics analysis. And so you can imagine writing a MassQL query once in one tool, and then you can hand it off to your friend. They can analyze their own data in the exact same way on their tool of choice. And so uh, you can, I think a lot of people have you know, experienced this as well as trying to learn a new interface try out a new feature and things like that is, you know, swapping, swapping between multiple GUIs is not the most fun thing in the world. And so this gives a little bit of consistency and reproduci reproducibility across different platforms, but it's definitely a work in progress to get all the features of MassQL in all the platforms, but um, we're advancing. So definitely give the developers feedback um, on that. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, we think the answer is yes, that we can create a solution you know, we have a few hundred users these days using MassQL. Um, and it's really cool, some of the things people are doing. Um, and so definitely feel free to use it and if, let us know if you have any questions. Um, but kind of the take home messages here with MassQL is it empowers you, especially if you're not super computationally savvy to develop these, interact with data and mine data in powerful ways. It gives you a lot of flexibility without the overhead of you know learning a particular language and infrastructure system and all that stuff. Um, it also allows bioinformaticians to integrate directly into their software as we've seen with these open source tools. Um, and we think that it's cool to be able to universally reuse these queries across multiple platforms, across multiple data. Um, and it's just, it's kind of this, as a common language that we can really be precise about what we were looking in, to find. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, thank you to, there's a huge thank you list for collaborators, mentors um, all ar around the world, especially UC San Diego, uh, where I did my graduate and postdoc work and uh, the funding most definitely, um, but also my lab at uh, UC Riverside, a bunch of the students are, are fantastic um, and the collaborators from around the world. Um, but before we get into the interactive hands-on portion, we can show you some of the things in GMPS2 uh, any questions so far? Don't be shy. We're all friends here. Well, let me ask you this as a follow-up question. Um, we're slowly rolling out GMPS2 as a new thing at uh, UC Riverside hosted by my lab, but we're trying to, you know, have it more distributed and federated so that we have more resiliency. So that's coming, but um, we're rolling that out. We have a few hundred users of like 300 and some users today, um, but we're slowly controlling the release because we are a young lab, a little over a year old. Um, I think we've, we've come a long way in that year, uh, but we also don't wanna grow and run out of resources uncontrollably. Oh, okay, so there's a question too. Um, can this be used, can MassQL, I think, presumably, be used for GCMS? So yes, so you can use it for GCMS. There's some um, caveats with it. So if you look at our preprint, there's actually a few examples of mining raw GC data with MassQL, and they were looking for some uh, like alcohol abuse and things like that, so you can see certain kinds of metabolism products. But one of the, the problems is um, uh, you run into this issue that you probably need to deconvolute it if you really want to get a lot of power out of it. So that's one limiting thing, but there have been some examples 
of uh, it being used in uh, in raw GC data. So definitely, definitely should be should be applicable. Um, so for untargeted analysis, uh, so this is so here's a question: How is this for untargeted analysis? Is it working? Because I give an example of targeted organic compounds. Right, so this is all on untargeted data. All of this data that we're analyzing is untargeted. If it's targeted, you don't, you can't look outside of what you've actually predefined a priori when you're defining your experiment. So there's on a, there's not much use of MassQL in, in this those contexts. So what we're doing here is we have we take untargeted data, and now you can come up with some sort of chemistry hypothesis to look for it. So in, in some, some senses, you're, you're transforming a untargeted experiment into a targeted experiment, if, if you want to think about it that way. But at least in my, in, to me, it's more about how do you start developing, developing a chemical hypothesis to prioritize data that might be present within your untargeted data. So, you know, you're casting a bigger net than, you know, creating an MRM transition for a particular compound, but it's not but you're, it's much more manageable than thinking about, okay, what are all the molecules and trying to explain everything here? Because if you prioritize everything, you've essentially prioritized nothing. So it's a, how do you focus your effort kind of question. Any other questions or any follow-ups? Well, hopefully there's, um, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of collaborators um, using MassQL, I think they're gonna, there's going to be some very cool papers coming out in the next year or two. Um, I, th I think one is under review at Cell, so I don't. I, let's see how that goes. Um, but at least I don't understand the chemistry or the bio, the downstream biology. But the collaborators are very excited, so we'll have to, we'll see how it, how it pans out. But um, so, is there anybody that? So anyway, for the GMPS two side, we're slowly growing. So if you would like a GMPS2 account, we can give out invite codes for that. Um, but we we'll maybe we'll handle have a different training session or a workshop for that as well. Um, but any other questions so far? It's good to see some familiar names. Feel free to ask questions. OK. So I'm going to go through some of these slides and I'll put some links in the chat, just interactive so you can, um, what is a diversity index? Okay, here's a question. Can you use this to calculate diversity indices? Uh, it depends what you mean by a diversity index. If you're talking about the amount of chemical diversity in a sample, uh, again, it depends on how you want to define it. Uh, one of the things you could think about doing is defining diversity indices within a particular chemical class. So uh, instead of like taking all the metabolites in an untargeted experiment, which is might not be particularly relevant to the kind of diversity you care about, maybe you care about, so for one, for one thing is um, uh, that, that Peter's group at UCSD has been using this for is looking for all analogs of bile acids. So looking at diversity of all metabolites isn't useful if you only care about answering the question about how much bile acid diversity is in one cohort versus another or you know, one bacteria making versus another. And so some of the ways that you could think about using that is you find all putative bile acids and ask about you know, the number of analogs in one condition versus another, right? So you can think about doing it in, in that sense. So it'd be more focused on a, going by the chemistry um, and then, but that's probably what you want anyway. Um, so especially because you don't really care about like contaminants, right? Plasticizers, right? Which would, if you just took everything that would contribute to some sort of, uh, chemical diversity. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So Frank was asking about, um, halogen searching. Yes. So a lot of the features that people use actually, so some of some industry collaborations, um, they've been using it specifically for looking at halogenated, fluorinated compounds. And for whatever reason, a lot of the tools out there are not very good for doing this. And they're like, MassQL gives us the ultimate flexibility and it, it's working really well for them. So you could start defining, you know, the isotopic pattern, defining the, uh, 
the error bars in, in uh, uh, as, as much as you'd like, understanding the variability of your instrument. And you can scale this out to huge amounts of data. I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people like this. Um, if you just really want to mine for the halogenated uh, specific, well, let's you pick one halogen, specific isotopic pattern. And then once you find that, you tell the system to grab the MS2 that's right next to it um, that comes from that precursor. Um, so that's a very common kind of pattern that we do. Uh, you could also think about uh, combining those two things, right? Uh, that I think that's, that's more interesting, at least computationally, is you look at the isotopic pattern and you're like, I want a particular substructure moiety that is exhibited by an MS2 fragment. So you combine multiple of those things and really start narrowing down uh, what you're looking for. So, but both of these things are are possible. Um, and I think I think we have some examples, but uh, uh, definitely take a look um, or reach out if you want to play around. We can give you some materials to get started. Um, and then there's also some really fancy stuff that we're doing where you can start looking, you know, at multi, like a big span of M over Z in the MS1, like the isotopic pattern here. And then you have another set of peaks there. So there's coelution happening. You can look for that. You can also talk about uh, a different mass that is offsite by M over Z and offset by a predefined retention time. So there's these like 2D kinds of queries that you can impart upon uh, uh, like entire LCMS runs that are supported now. It's super slow, but it, it definitely can, it can find what you want it to find. So these are kind of the advanced things we can start thinking about. Um, any other questions? Right, so um, does mass scale work better for elements with a distinct isotopic pattern um, if it's monoisotopic, right? So this is a good question. So if you're looking at the MS1 level, uh, obviously, if there's a distinctive isotopic pattern from the element, definitely it's going to work better, right? It's all about patterns, right? And it's not going to be, you, there has to be some sort of signal. If everything's monoisotopic and there's no other, there's only one stable isotope, yeah, okay, it's just going to look like a peak that's going to look like a peak, right? So it's not particularly interesting. Now, that being said, there are other things you can start thinking about where as mass resolution increases, the not ever not it's not just a single peak anymore. You can start looking at these you know these small gradations in uh, uh, you know there's the you lose mass because of the the number of protons right. So fine uh, fine isotopes right. So you could think about it if you re had really high mass accuracy data. We've never done this, but I imagine you could think about looking for cool patterns with fine isotope resolution. Uh, which would be pretty cool. But if you're talking about from a pretty gross perspective where it's like you're considering like you know, new like uh, one Dalton at a time shifts, it will it's better to have some sort of advantage in um, uh, isotopic pattern. But just to give you an idea, some of the stuff we're working on, I think it's it's, it's already out. Um, or some of this stuff is already out. Um, working with Allegra Aaron, we're looking for iron bound molecules, like spherophores, and they produce pretty unique isotopic pattern. Um, and so you're probably not going to get much mileage out of, you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, at least when you're talking about like, you know, Dalton shifts between isotopes. Um, but some of the more interesting ones, interesting elements, uh, there's definitely a lot to, to kind of pick up there. Any other questions? We got all, we got time. We got time. So um, I also remind want to remind you one thing that Danny and I do um, every week um, is on Monday mornings, maybe it's a bad time, but anyway, it works for my schedule this quarter. But Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific time, we ho hold office hours. So sometimes, you know, we get a million emails a day. So sorry, apologies if we, you know, for, especially we're not collaborating on a grant or a project. It's sometimes hard to respond. Um, but uh, if you want to pop in for office hours without, you don't even have to talk to us, just come and say hi and chat. So if you want to ask questions, it's a way to meet new people without an overly burdensome logistic tale for me um, and, and for Daniel. So uh, think, think about it, low pressure um, uh, if you have any questions. Any, any other questions while we're here?
so yeah, Frank is asking, what is the link? So if you Google GMPS2 and office hours, you'll find it. It's pretty Googleable. I probably should link it from my website, but anyway, that's a it's a separate uh, lab website. But um, but yeah. And my name is pretty Googleable, so just as a heads up. So, any other questions so far? Oh, thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Okay. So let's, let's, we're going to go on to an interactive portion. We're just trying to tickle your imagination on how you can start thinking about injecting MassQL into any of your work, you know, your, your kind of day, day, daily analysis. So uh, there are kind of two ways right now at GMPS2 that you can start interacting with MassQL. Number one, there's a workflow, right? So if you ever use GMPS1, you're kind of familiar, you can run these computational workflows. You can select, you know, any number of mass spec files throw a MassQL query against it, and you're off to the races. It'll just tell you what's going on. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can extract the spectra that you find, right? Imagine you, you throw in 10 million MSMS spectra, and it comes out with 1,000. You can extract that as a, to a separate MZML file and take it to your favorite program. So we just make it a little easy for like uh, molecular networking. You can, you can just take that subset of chemistry and make molecular networks out of it. Um, and so you can you can do things like that, uh, but you can also interactively explore these molecular networks and impose some priority on uh, with MassQL. And we're going to show you some examples of this. Um, but Christian asked a good question: Is it possible to link GMPS two accounts to GMPS one? So no, totally new accounts. Uh, you can import uh, now like some of the old analyses in GMPS one, but it's not great. Uh, it's not great, but, uh, if you want to count, we'll, we'll do a little workshop for the lab. So we'll figure it out. I, we think it's good, but anyway, it's a totally new architecture and it makes it a lot more extensible and portable. Um, and we think resilient. So, um, anyway, we'll, we'll cross that bridge. When we... So first thing for MassQL is let me show you an interactive visualization. So let me just put this here so you all can play with it. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, no, you don't want the picture. Uh, here we go. So what you'll see is something like this, right? So this is just just an FYI. This is the new some of the new interactive visualization tools in GMPS two. So you can visualize entire networks. You can you know change labels, do a lot of stuff. But the bottom line here for us to think about is, let me just, is we have a little field down here that's called MassQL highlight. And so this allows you to put in any MassQL query and it'll find it, right? So it'll show up in purple here. And so I just happen to um, pick a particular peak that is present in cholic acid. So this is a bile acid, um, this 373 right over here. And we can see there's a MassQL where I can look for 373. Pretty straightforward. But it allows you to start really exploring it from the mass spec data perspective. So you can imagine, maybe I want to look for 817.58. So there's, there's actually a shorthand way to do it. So 817.58, it writes the MassQL query below. And you can be, this makes a very simple MassQL query. So you can make a very fancy one. And so what happens is you can see the purple, it changed. So it's another peak here for cholic acid. Um, and it, highlighted a couple other things in the network, but maybe we want this to be really uh, intense. You can put that particular condition um, on the query as well. So you could be like, I think it's, I forget the syntax, uh, uh, intensity. Uh, something like this, intensity equals a percent percent equals how about 30%. So there we go. It only finds MSMS spectra where that peak is at least 30% uh, of the intensity. So, you know, one way to start exploring these things interactively, um, just because all the data and all the, the tools are in one place. So does that, any questions so far for, you know, what we do there? Okay. So just as a just a T there, you know, I think it's kind of cool. Is imagine if you enter these MassQL queries and you kind of 
you know, sized, let's say you colored the no these nodes by Omar Z or something. There's some sort of tailoring of the networks that you want uh, want done. So one of the things you can do is share what you've done by clicking this. It creates a giant URL and it saves everything you've done in the visualization. And so you can send it to your, your PI collaborators um, and things like that. So it's kind of cool um, just to be able to share uh, you know, visualizations and analyses with others. Um, so that's kind of one, one side effect. There's also like other features here. We won't talk about it um, right now, but that's one way that you can integrate MassQL with, if you're already doing like molecular networking uh, directly together um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a directed way. Any questions so far? Okay, so one other thing that I wanna just demonstrate here is we have, um, let me put this here. So this happens to be, oh, again, thanks Zoom. Okay. Um, here is a GMPS2 job that show we used MassQL to search some data. So we, this happens to be a pretty small set, about seven data files, but here is the results page of GMPS2 and you can look at the query results. And so this gives you a big table this actually happens to be a MassQL query that didn't really do anything, but it just kind of proves the principle. But what you can see is it shows you the path of the, the file name, the scan number, retention time, precursor, MO, Z, and you can, these are all the hits in your data depending on your MassQL query. And so one of the things you can do is you can uh, visualize the context in the entire LCMS run in the GMPS dashboard directly. So this happens to be the XIC here. Um, and the MSMS um, for your MassQL results. So trying to make it simple for everybody. You can also create the USI figure. So if you want to publish something here, but what's also interesting is you have this little link here that says downstream run molecular networking. It can take exactly the subset of spectra that you found with MassQL, as I mentioned before, and create a molecular network. So it just makes it really easy um, and seamless to kind of do this sort of analysis. Obviously you can also go here to browse all results. And if you want, you can browse everything that's output um, and you can download um, you can download all the results and things like that um, one file at a time or everything together. It makes it really easy to just get the files out if you wanna do your own custom downstream analysis. And there's also web APIs where you can pull the data super easily. Um, but the bottom line for us, is it makes it super easy to um, you know, interact with the system, whether inside the system or outside the system. We just want to make everything um, reasonably open. Is there any questions so far? OK, one final thing that I think is very fun, and, I, and you can kind of see it too, is uh, I sort of forgot some of the syntax for MassQL. I mean, it's not the most complex thing, but there's a lot you can do with it. And so one of the things that I wanted to show you is we we built our own little kind of GPT-4 uh, MassQL thing, right? It's not the most complicated thing, but it is pretty cool. Um, and I will say, if you aren't subscribed, paying for uh, ChatGPT or ChatGPT-4 or Plus or whatever they call it, uh, get your lab to pay for it. I, I honestly think it's worth it. Um, so we wrote, and you have to have, uh, let me put it down here. If you all do have it, you can pay, you can try it out just because you do need a subscription because it is based on ChatGPT4. Um, and we're, we have a student working on this to just refine this more, but already so far, it's, it's really impressive. So what you can do, the most natural thing, sometimes I just want to write English or I want to take a little passage from a paper and write a MassQL query for it. And this, this actually it works, which is very impressive. So I, I just have a few examples here where it's like write a MassQL query where we want to find uh, MS2 spectra that includes 225 MRZ and 227 with a 20 ppm tolerance for both peaks. Now, this is not the most fancy query. Yeah, not the most fancy query, but it freaking did it. And one of the things you can do, you can actually, so that's that's something you can, you can do. Um, and we can write something a little bit more advanced, but I want to show you um, just let me go to the compendium and I'm just going to grab, uh, I don't, let's just take one of these. So one of the things, if you want to 
have a little bit more experience with MassQL, just to give you an example, to understand what the queries mean. So if we place the query here, we have these English, Portuguese, Spanish translations, and they're like, they're kind of stupid, right? Like, it's clear, like, we programmatically explain these things. It's not the, the most complicated, the fanciest thing, right? But what you can do in, in, in ChatGPT is, please explain this query. Um, and it does a much better job than we, we as developers of MassQL could, right? It's honestly really impressive. So if you want to think about it as a learning tool to, to understand the language, um, and also if somebody put this in a paper, you can, you can kind of look at it. And there's some really fancy stuff that you can do that you, you it, it can help you explain it as well as write queries directly. Right. Um, it, it honest, especially for, uh, if you're not familiar with MassQL and you want to write your first MassQL query that you can immediately take and, uh, run on GMPS2, it, it is, it's kind of mind blowing that it, it even works. So, uh, it, this is, but anyway, this is something we've been putting together. Um, and we just want to make data mining and really accessible. And so I think MassQL as a language and the compute engine behind it and ChatGPT as a front end to really connect to people um, is, a, is a pretty reasonable uh, combination to make this happen. Uh, so anyway, I'm pretty excited about these things. Uh, we're we're going to, you know, we're definitely going to refine them as, as we move forward, but already uh, some of the stuff really feels like magic. And even when I put some of these things together, just, I was at ASMS last year. And I was like, well, what if we tried it? And it just worked out of the box. And um, it, I was, it was, it was, it was very exciting. So um, hopefully you can, if you want to play around with it and let us know when it doesn't work, that's, it's hard for us to really understand the level of creativity that you all can express. So uh, we definitely welcome, you know, welcome people to play around. So anyway, any thoughts, questions, uh, concerns? That's all very impressive. I mean, I'm pretty awesome, especially the JetGTP part. Um, I don't know, did you plan on showcasing another hands-on example or are we like then mainly through and could go to like the in more interactive like discussion part? Yeah, I think well, I'm good on demos. I'm happy to like, if there's some questions that come up, we can go in and uh, try a few things. But I think perhaps it's it's good to reserve a little bit. Maybe we'll schedule something. Um, a VMOL, like GMPS2 specific workshop where it's like we mm -hmm. run some jobs, we create accounts for everybody in the workshop um, and things like that, uh, just so we have a little bit more time. Um, yeah, definitely. So a little spoiler. So that's, I think, what we um, plan for the spring quarter. So uh, if everything is ready and you're available, that would be, of course, amazing to do that. Um, and then, yeah, I think for now, we still have like 10 minutes. So I think we can like go into like the question and answer. So those of you who are going to take off, uh, um, thanks for stopping by. Thanks so much, Ming, for, for giving this amazing presentation and showing all like the super cool tools and hope to see you next time.